Hello and welcome to Talk Bowling episode 111. I'm John Congdon. I'm Tony Ruco. Talk Bowling is proud to bring you the latest information from the bowling industry, bowling tips, and updates on a large internet bowling website, bowlingball.com. I got the camera way back this time. I know, it's not all up in my grill. I went to the other extreme. Yeah. Uh, if my shirt is too busy for everybody, it's John's fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> we, we have a, a very long episode for you today. Yeah, a very special treat. Uh, we got the opportunity to have a Skype call with Jason Belmonte, uh, mm-hmm. talk about his season, talk about his player of the year, uh, voting or you know his bid for player of the year. We got to find out a lot of really cool facts about him that I didn't know, um, and I enjoyed it. I thought it was a really fun time. Uh, excuse the call quality, it was Skype around the world. Yeah, we got to talk to him from his home in Australia to our offices here in Florida. So, so there are a few, few parts that are a little choppy. Uh, the sound quality at times isn't the best, but you'll be able to hear it, you'll get it, and enjoy it. Yeah. So. All right. Okay. Um, if you could go ahead and tell us about the season you've had and what it would mean to you to be player of the year. Right. Um, this season has been, uh, it's been a few things. Um, it's been really short. I can't believe it's over. Um, I feel like all of us on tour wanted wanted another full season more, like we wanted to double the length of the season. Um, you know, it's usually you come down to the last few weeks and everybody's kind of hitting their straps. They're, they're really starting to uh, narrow their games in a little bit. And and uh, I felt like across the whole board, we all wanted more games. But as it is, um, it was really short and you had to make the most of, of the opportunities that you got. And um, I was very, very proud of myself that, you know, when I was... Uh, on TV or had a chance to win, I, uh, I did three times and um, the other times I, I either got, you know, flat out out bowled um, or, you know, I, I kind of dug my own grave. So be that as it may, I was really happy with the majority of my TV shows, which is, like I said, you take the, the most of your advantages and I felt like I did as a whole. That's great. And I, I do agree. It does seem like the season was really short. It wasn't... Yeah, to it. yeah, from the other end, it seems short as well. Yeah. How are things at home with the birth of your second child, Hugo? Yeah, he's fantastic. Um, he's in the room next to me right now, <laughs> sleeping away. Um, he's, uh, he's awesome. I can't believe he, uh, he waited for me. I, I was for sure um, going to get a text message while I was in Vegas that, uh, you know, honey, I'm going to uh, the hospital now. <laughs> right. Um, you know what we have. But uh, the message never came, and... Um, just very, very grateful that um, I managed to, to leave and, and come back in time. Oh, I must have misread that on Twitter. I thought you actually, the child was born while you were bowling. Must have misread no, it. No, you definitely, you definitely misread it. <laughs> um, I, I had left and um, Kimberly had gone into the early stages of labor in the last couple of days I was away um, and she managed to uh, to hold on for me for a couple of days, which was just uh, phenomenal. That's, so that's I came home. Uh, a day after I came home, we were uh, we had a little baby boy in our hands. Awesome. Very cool. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations yep. on that. Um, in your bowling career and with your family, what, what kind of sacrifices have you had to make? Obviously, it's, it's got to be a little tough being that you live in Australia, uh, but just in general in your career and your family life, what kind of sacrifices have you had to make for your career on tour? You know, early on when I was younger in my teens, it was, uh, you know, parties and things like that that your friends would host. And um, you would go away, even if it was just a weekend tournament somewhere in, uh, in Australia, you would go away and come back and you'd see photos and, you'd, you know, everyone at school would be talking about how crazy the party was and you always felt like you missed out. And that was, as a teenager, it was really difficult because you certainly felt like you were, I don't know, a little bit outside the... Travelled almost every weekend but the late, in the later years of school. So there are a lot of things there I miss. But, you know, when looking back, it wasn't such a big sacrifice in the end. Um, you know, I definitely love bowling more than partying, so it, it worked out best. But in the, in the later years of my life, it's, it's been more about the, the moments that you never get back, um, whether it be uh, a family getting together and, you know, just great conversation and funny stories are told and then a photo is taken and, you know, you see it on Facebook and you see uh, your cousins, your sister, your, your 
wife, your mum and dad, and, and you're not in that photo. And yeah. it, it definitely becomes a little bit, um, a little difficult, especially when you've been away for a long time. And all you do is you talk to everybody back home and you ask them how they all are, and then they, they go on and tell you about all the cool things that have happened. And, and then recently, in the last two years, it's been more about your children. You know, it's, um, you know, talking to my daughter on Skype and, um, Kimberly will tell me some of the cool things that she did that day or, you know, even if she's had a rough day, even if, you know, if Ari had been a little bit, you know, whingy or tired and she was a, right. a little pain, pain in the behind, you kind of, you miss that. You want to be home to kind of, you know, be the father figure in that instance as well. But um, my wife, Kimberly, and my entire family for that matter, they know, you know, what I was put on this earth to do and that was to, uh, to roll a ball down. Uh, at some pins, and uh, they're very supportive of my career, and and I can't do what I do if I don't have that support for it back home. I felt like if I was put under a lot of pressure from my my wife and my family to stay home, uh, to find a normal job, um, I think my career wouldn't be as successful because I definitely leave Australian shores, and I don't feel guilty leaving I, I really don't I feel like I have a lot of support and a lot of love behind me and um, and I think all athletes for that matter that have that support group it, it definitely makes it e easier for them to do what they do when they're traveling yeah. yeah that's great when you do come over to the states for the tour how long are you gone do you get to go home in between stops or are you over here for a chunk of time um, it, it kind of varies on depending on what's happening back home um, if there is a very special occasion that I, I will not miss for anything, um, then I definitely go home in between stops. It is very expensive to fly from uh, Australia to America. So I try to keep my stay in the States or anywhere for that matter around the world for as long as possible on one airline ticket. Um, if you're coming back and forth, back and forth, um, you're going to start racking up that um, that airline bill. And whilst you get a lot of frequent flyer miles to go with it, it doesn't quite counteract the thousands of dollars that you're spending to do that. Um, but yeah, I try to spend um, as long as, as humanly possible without coming without staying too long, if that makes any sense. And, okay. and I have a bit of a deal with my wife. It's about four weeks um, as a maximum right now. Um, it used to be eight weeks. And that was before kids, and you know, two months away from the ones that you left home and your family and friends, it's it is really tough living out of a suitcase. So we decided to change that number to four weeks. It's made it a lot easier, but even still, four weeks is a long way to be to be away. Plus, your government only lets me stay in the country for three months anyway. So if I stay uh, longer than three months, I'm never allowed back. So I see. it gives me yeah, it gives me a good. Uh, Especially with the little ones, they grow so fast. So two months. Yeah, I, I couldn't do I couldn't do too much away from my kids. That would be uh, extremely tough for me. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the next question. We'll talk a little bit about Storm. Obviously, we we both have a, a common uh, relationship with Storm, uh, and obviously, Storm is one of the best ball manufacturers on the planet right now. Uh, what do you like most about the Storm equipment that you get to use? Uh, well, first, I really want to take this opportunity to thank them. Um, you know, I was signed with Storm many moons ago uh, when I was just a kid, just a teenage kid, and, and my game was very, very uh, jagged and choppy. It was pure power. I used, to, I used to run to the line very hard, and I used to give it everything I had. And, you know, I used to send a lot more messengers back in those days, but I used to leave a lot more five counts as well. Um, <laughs> But even even then, Storm saw an opportunity in me, and and um, Mr. Chrisman uh, used to always say, you know, once you work out what you're doing, when you when you know what you're doing, the way that you throw the ball, he said, no one's going to beat you, and I want you on on my team. I want you a part of my family, and and at that point, I'd written a couple of letters to old shoulder, which was fine because who was I? I was this 15, 16 year old. Let me real quick. You, you froze up there for a yeah. second when you said you wrote a letter and then you froze for a second. Oh, right. I didn't want to miss I, that. I, I'd written a couple of letters to other manufacturers at the time asking for a sponsorship and you know I got the, got the cold shoulder. They were polite, you know, there's no room on our staff and, and it was a very short, quick letter but and I didn't expect too much. I mean, who was I? I was this, you know, 15, 16 year old kid who had long kind of curly hair and used to keep my shirts untucked and you know I used to bowl funny 
So I didn't expect anything, and then and then Bill gave me the chance, and ever since throwing their equipment, my game has has evolved uh, dramatically. Um, you know, when you have the ability to trust the the piece of equipment in your hand, knowing that you have the the right ball for every and any kind of lane condition, it certainly frees up your swing. You, you don't ever feel like there's a better option with another company because you have the best bowling balls out there, and you know the results, especially this season. I mean, we we dominated uh, bowling, we dominated world bowling, not just the PBA, but we were winning stops all over the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, if there was one guy using our equipment and winning it, then you could just say that that guy is brilliant. And you know, it doesn't matter what bowling ball he has. But when you have such a range of bowlers um, throwing storm equipment and and winning. It's a bit of both. It's the it's the athlete, but it's also his equipment. And um, you know, I heard plenty of the pro guys on tour this season. Uh, you know, quietly mutter up in their breath, "I wish I could uh, be throwing that ball right now." <laughs> and um, you know, it, it definitely brings a smile on our face because it's it's almost an intimidation factor. It's almost like when you start throwing the right equipment, they already feel like they're behind the eight ball because they can't throw it. Yeah, like you've got and a little bit of an edge on them. Right, and that's a huge advantage into it, especially with the seasons and the game so short. If you can get any kind of that um, mental kind of upper hand, then you know it, it's got to benefit you. We're going to pause just for a second because your video is still a little blurry, and I don't want to miss anything here. Sure. Right. What are you going to do? Probably not the video. I think I'm just blurry naturally. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if we could if the internet would clear up here for a second. In a second for you. Could be because you're in Australia on the other side there. Usually, usually my connection is pretty poor. We're, we're very fortunate that it would last this long, so we should be thankful. Gotcha. All right, well, we'll continue on. Uh, do you currently have a favorite ball that you use, or is it really just the right ball for the right condition? Um, there is a ball that I like to take everywhere with me. Um, right now it's the Marble Pearl. It's, uh, it's a strong enough call to really allow me to use it on a high volume of oil and I can I can put some surface on it if I need to and then if the pattern you know breaks down a little bit because it's a pearlized car it really gets through the front and the mid part of the lane just so easily and then of course it's got a big enough engine in the ball to, to really turn the corner when it needs to down the lane and you know I've thrown that ball um, playing a five uh, 100 miles an hour and you know, I've won, you know, like at the World Series, I, I won a few tournaments, lost in the left cap, slow, slow hooking the ball. So it's, it's, it's extremely vertical. I mean, to, to play up five and then lock the left cutter with the exact same ball, not a different ball, different drilling, the exact same ball, um, you know, that's pretty special. So that, that's one of the balls that I, I like to take with me all the time. But um, I think, you know, my favorite ball has to be the, the Belmo ball. I mean, come on. Of course. <laughs> I have a follow-up to that real quick. You mentioned uh, drillings on there. Do you choose the drillings, or does the storm staff or, or the tour rep choose the, the drilling patterns you're going to use, or the layouts you're going to use? Uh, Del Ballard um, and, and Chris are the two ball reps for uh, Tom and Road Grip. And what makes them, in my opinion, the two best guys on tour is... They are very forceful. They don't tell you what what you should do. We will have a discussion about it, and, and um, you know, Chris just always said to me, he said, Look, "There's no, no point me putting a ball in your hand if you just are completely against it. And if you just throw it with full commitment, uh, it's very difficult for me to prove to you that that ball is correct." So we've built a, a relationship, both Dell and Chris, uh, with myself for for a couple of years now, and you get to the point where. It's almost like you're talking to a buddy, you know, in league, like, you know, what ball should I get next? And, and you're kind of talking about it, and all of a sudden, the, the problem that you have, the solution presents itself to conversation. You know, it'll be basically, you know, I, I think I need something that's just hook a little early. What do you guys think? And then he said, wait, you know, you threw this ball really well, do you like that? And, and it's a really cool kind of like you know, back and forth. And then all of a sudden, we'll finish the conversation, and I'll go, oh, that sounds perfect. And it, it wouldn't be something that either of us kind of just do in each other's face. If I don't go to Chris and say, I want a marble pearl, do it like this, do it for me. 
and he very rarely will come down to me and say, here's a ball I drilled for you, just throw it. It's right. very much a conversational thing, and, and I think that's really great. I think it, it definitely builds a, a relationship and a trust between rep and player, and and that, for me, is, is something that's very important. It sounds like it's gotten more of a uh, more of a golfer caddy relationship with some of the changes they've made with ball reps being able to assist during shows and, and with the fact that they're helping you choose equipment. It sounds like you're developing more of that kind of relationship with the ball yeah, reps. Yeah, well, a couple of years ago when the ball reps weren't allowed to help, it was really difficult because I'm a stubborn person by nature to start with. And, you know, when I'm on the lanes and I'm bowling and I see the ball roll the way that I see it, it was very difficult for me to go up to Chris or to Dell later on um, and then tell me, well, this is what you should have done. Because my response was, yeah, well, well, that's not how I saw it. So right. So you're wrong. <laughs> and then, you know, now we can get a field shot here or there, or we can, you know, if I'm struggling through a game, I can kind of, you know, throw caution into the wind a little bit and try an idea. And, and that's what's so great about it is that He'll come down, one of them will come down and say, look, you know, we don't, we don't like what's happening out there. What are your feelings? What are your thoughts? And then we'll, we'll try something, and then all of a sudden, it'll either work or it doesn't. But as far as I'm concerned, if it does work or it doesn't work, it's telling me something new about the pattern. And from there, you can create a, another idea, if need be, to, to find the one that works. And trust me, you know, on tour, um, you get a lot more guesses wrong than you do right. And... <laughs> Um, over the course of, of a season, but when you do get it right, you've got to take advantage of it. And, and I felt like this season, I really did that. Gotcha. You don't have time All right. Uh, how did you de develop the two-handed release that you use today? Um, the way it all started was there's a really long story, but I won't get into it. Uh, my parents built a bowling center when I was um, just born, mm -hmm. and the lightest bowling ball we had was uh, ten pound. Uh, so I, when I first started bowling, I was 18 months old. Uh, I couldn't obviously pick it up like a, a, a normal bowler. So I just developed kind of pushing the ball down. And as I was getting older, still strong enough, I just picked it up with two hands um, and and just kind of developed that style quite naturally. And my parents themselves weren't bowlers at all. Uh, um, they'd never really bowled a ball. I don't think they actually had ever bowled a ball before opening the bowl. Um, it was purely a business idea. So they never coached it out of me from an early age. They never said, hey, this is how mom and dad do it. You know, you should do it like we do. They just saw me with a smile on my face. And, and as far as they were concerned, I was, you know, out of their hair while they were working. I was on, you know, lane 16 up the end of the building, you know, with my own ball and a pair of shoes. And for a couple of hours, they felt like they could, uh, they could do work without having to have a little ankle bar, you know, running around their heels telling them to pick him up and, and beat wow. him and something like that. Whatever, whatever ankle bars do. Very interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, you've answered a lot about the, the life, your life on the tour. How Overall, how is the tour life as far as just all the good, the bad, all the stuff that goes on with other players? Overall, how is it? Um, all right. There's, there's a few things that uh, um, probably aren't known to the rest of the world on bowling is – is um, when I started first traveling around the world to bowl for a living, in every other continent on earth, bowling is, is not done for a living. Um, it's more of a, it is very competitive, the bowlers are brilliant, but everybody has a job at the end of the day. So win or lose, you're all kind of friends. And I've developed some really unbelievable friendships with those people from all over the world. Now, I fast forward that to the PBA, and this is our job. This is how we make our living. And I think the naiveness to me was that everyone's your mate, like it was in every other part of the world that I'd gone to. And I opened myself up to almost everyone on tour. You know, a lot of people knew about my life and about my family. And, and I think that was probably my mistake because a lot of these guys, they didn't really me or my family. They care about, about winning and about beating me. And when it gets to the point where you feel like you're friends with a lot of people and then you start beating them consistently, that friendship that you thought was there is no longer. Mm. And again, that was just a, a you know Australian country boy who, who lives his life very uh, relaxed and carefree, kind of getting slapped in the face by reality on tour. Um, and 
I think I needed that. It definitely sparked me to, to work harder on my game. And, you know, the, the, the sad reality is um, I, I felt like I was probably friends with everyone on the tour, and now I have a handful of mates that I, I trust and that I talk to, and the rest are my competitors. And it's, it's really sad because that's not how I, how I was brought up in bowling. I've always been brought up and you shake everyone's hand, you, you, you offer a drink to whoever's in the bar and you, you go and you go to dinner with anyone, but it's not like that on tour. It's very clicky um, and, you know, people will quite happily throw you under the bus at the first chance they get if it's going to benefit them. So I've definitely learned my, my lessons and I think you guys have seen what some of the things I've had to deal with, which... You know, it just blows my mind. That's how it's like on tour. But the reality is it is. And, um, you know, you have to take the punches when they're thrown and, uh, and get up and throw them back harder. That is sad because I would expect it to be competitive, but at the end of the day, you're bowling. <laughs> so it should be somewhat fun. And I haven't bowled a lot of tournaments, but local tournaments, it is more friendly, like you're making it out to be. Yeah, so it is sad that... It's that competitive and catty. And like I said at the very beginning, it's not, it's, not, it's not bad. It's not like it's the worst thing in the world that these guys are all about themselves. Like I said, this is their job. Yeah. You know? And the difference between me beating them or them beating me is food on their family's table, is um, you know, leverage for sponsorships. It, it's so many things. It goes so deep. And, and I was just this happy-go-lucky kind of kid who just didn't didn't know anything sure. about this and you know you, you, you're offering your, you're offering these guys to go to dinner with you and then you know the next tournament they're basically calling you a cheater and you're like whoa how did this happen you know <laughs> yesterday we were going to dinner at some restaurant having a good old laugh and then I beat you and now you have a problem with me and right. It has been difficult, but I understand it, and I don't have a problem with. It. I really don't. I don't have a problem with these guys, and you know, at the end of the day, I, I'm I've got to be that way for my family. You know, it's it's dog eat dog world, and um, you know, you just have to to be tough. You have to you know, toughen up a little bit. Yes. So, uh, one more quick question about just on the tour outside of Chris and Dell. Do you have any other kind of assistance out on tour, or are those two guys really your go-tos out there, along with maybe a couple of the Storm guys that are friends? No, those two guys, are they're my Storm reps. They're the guys that, you know, who will lay the bowling balls out for me um, and, and tell me what they see on the lanes. But I have a coach, and her name's Deandra Asbury. Um Deandra and I, we also own a coaching company together, the International Art of Bowling. So for the past 18 months to two years, I've been working very closely with her and Ron Hoppy, who was also a partner in the company, um, with my gang. And um, when you when you work with someone very closely and you bowl with them a lot, and you actually open yourself up to to be able to take criticism where it's needed, and 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 able to listen to ideas and implement them, I feel like between Deandra and Ron, my game has improved so much uh, because of their coaching. Um, you know, and often Deandra is, is bowling the tournaments that either I'm at or if she's not, um, usually she's watching on, on the uh, extra frame. Mm. And, you know, I'll get a text message if, if she's not there or, or she'll come and talk to me about, you know, what what's missing. And um, in a lot of the times, it's usually something mental for me. Usually my head kind of switches off. I'm thinking about home too much or whatever it is, and she kind of, gets me to go into that right direction again. So I definitely do owe a lot um, to Deandra in particular, but both Ron and Deandra um, for helping me to get my game a lot more refined this season than in the years gone by. But that's interesting. I didn't know Deandra was a, a, a coach. I knew you guys were involved in the IAB together. I guess one question I have now that I understand that, and you touched a little bit on it, how much can she assist with your game? Knowing I've coached in the past and I'm a bowler, you have a lot of mechanical movements that we don't have in a, in a traditional bowling style. So, outside of the mental aspect, how how into your mechanical game can she get? Right. Well, if you get a chance, I, I want you to watch a video of me, say three, four years ago, and then pull up one from the World Series to of this season, and everything that you see different 
from three years ago to today has really been because of the instruction from her. Hmm. Um, the one thing that a lot of people kind of, I think, I think the two-handed style scares them because it looks so different. They're not willing to actually take a closer look at it. And Deandra has been quite willing to take a closer look at it. And she's noticed that there are so many similarities between your traditional bowler and a two-handed bowler that it's, it's kind of scary. So she's definitely implemented a lot of the things that she's been taught through her career into my game. Now, I've grown up never having a coach. So I can tell you that hearing someone or, t or, or, or someone coming up to you and suggest something that doesn't make sense to you, I'm pretty stubborn. And my, my first answer is, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> We've uh, we've had our arguments and fights in practice sessions, um, you know, plentiful. And when I finally realised, you know, it doesn't matter whether it works or not. It, it just matters that I try it. And if it if it does work, then brilliant. And if it doesn't, we we can throw that out out the window and try something new. So I finally realised it's time to kind of mature up a little bit. Stop being that um, stubborn kid that. Um, I have always been and kind of opened myself up to suggestion and then all of a sudden uh, her suggestions seem to be just you know everyone seemed to be hitting out of the park for me she missed a couple of them and then she got the rest of them right and um, yeah I, I recommend her as a coach highly and this is coming from someone who um, doesn't take you know direction very well and and she was she's managed to be able to kind of Get in my head a little bit to, to know how to say things so it makes sense to me and and uh, it seems to be working. So as of right now, she's got the job as coach, and, and until uh, until she starts to you know ruin my game, she'll probably be my coach for a little while longer. But what can you tell us about your new youth uh, tour that will be starting soon? Yeah, we're really excited about this at the uh, at the IAB. Um, Vienna called me and said that she had this idea. And I, I was a little bit uh, worried about what this idea would be. Um, and she, she said, you know, I really want to uh, in, help you, youth bowlers out there um, generate some kind of uh, scholarship money. Now, in Australia, we don't have any of this kind of scholarship money. There's no collegiate bowling. There's no high school bowling. So it's all... Port bowling. So she, she suggested that we run a little, little um, tour in which the prizes are all um, scholarship funds towards uh, university and that really intrigued me because I, I think that's a really good um, kind of direction for the youth of, of especially America. is bowl to, to, to study, bowl to educate and that's just awesome. So Wrap their brains a little bit. Come up with what's called the Elite Youth Tour, uh, and basically it's going to be starting in the Midwest. And uh, uh, May twenty sixth, I believe, is the uh, the first stop. And um, really, really looking forward to. It. We've got a couple of formats for the kids to try, and, and uh, one of the bonuses of playing is uh, if you win the spot to junior gold. Uh, you can involve for an extra few prizes in scholarship funds and also equipment by uh, bowling me for a head to head match. If they beat me, they get uh, a brand ball from Norm and then there'll be some more um, uh, scholarship funds towards their education. So I really want to be involved. I really want to be just that guy at the back who you know, occasionally claps at, at some kid's bowling. I want to be right in the middle of it all. Uh, Deandra wants to be right in the middle of it all. and. Um, I feel like this is going to be real because I don't know any other tour out there where under 50 year old boys and girls and under 20 year old boys and girls get to the bowl and game match against the world's best bowls, one of the, the, the stars and the PBA. I feel like that's really the really issue that we have, and I really hope to keep them out there and support the tournament because ultimately uh, it's all about them. You know, we, we're going to get 100 for their um their scholarship funds, so you know we won't take money out of the tournament. Um, and I feel like that. 
that's uh, pretty special. So I hope the kids do too and, and take full advantage of it. Great. That sounds like an awesome cause. We, I, I wish we would get more things like that going for the youth and bowling. Um, okay, we'll, we'll just ask you one more question and then we'll let you go. Um, growing up, who was your greatest influence, both in general and then also in bowling? Who did you look up to as you were growing up? Uh, in bowling, I had, oh, I would say, three main influences in my life. First one was a guy by the name of Peter Brown. No one will ever have heard of He's a local bowler here in the small town of Orange where I live. Uh, believe it or not, he's a lefty. I can't believe I played as a lefty, but <laughs> I did. Um, I was very young. I was, uh, I'll blame it on my age. I didn't know any different. <laughs> um, I was young. I was probably like four, the age of four to like ten. Um, I idolized a guy like that used to have a homo from the right side of his head to the left side. <laughs> and I used to wake up in the morning, comb my hair with a comb, just nice. to be like him. Um, <laughs> so I used to watch him, and he was a really friendly guy, and was very, very competitive, always gave me five. No matter who it was, a kid, um, you know, a teenager or, or a competitor, he always gave five, and he gave everyone luck. And I really, I really loved that about him. I think I took that from him as something that I learned most. It's always put your hand out. Whether they hit it or not, it's a different story. Offer your, your congratulations on that shot and see what happens from there. The next guy was, was um, Tim Mack. He came to Australia and just uh, blew me away. Watching that he his passion on the plane, it just distilled this amazing image. And, you know, he, I'm sure if he would have cut it open, it would bleed both. You know, he, he's just... Uh, Raw passion for games. I love that, and I, I took that from him, and, and I realized that and he made me realize that I'm very fortunate to do something that I love and do it well enough to make a living from it. And Timmy taught me that, taught me to really um, appreciate what I do, and that I'm very lucky to be able to do it. And I, I really, I really love him for that. Uh, and then the, the probably the main guy of the world was an Australian bowler called Andrew Crawley. Um, he was the first guy that travelled from Australia to do Asian bowling, European bowling, PDF bowling. And I learned a lot from him by travelling with him. We would uh, room together, we would talk about balls, layouts, we'd talk about playing conditions. And, you know, he was almost like that big brother of mine I never had. He, he always looked out for me. Um, whether we were competing against each other or not, he'd always offer me advice about what I was doing wrong, what he thought was the right thing to do. I, I learned a lot from him. And I learned a lot from him, and um, I really, I really appreciate that Andrew was from Australia because I don't know how good of a bowler I would have been uh, growing up without his um, guidance. Uh, overall, I think I enjoyed watching uh, Roger Federer, all the sports out there. Um, just the way he's the you know, he's extremely happy-go-lucky, very friendly guy, um, and when he plays tennis, it's, it's almost like like music, the watching music, it's like this rhythm that is unlike any other player out there. He, he runs quickly without looking like he's sprinting, and he's, his timing is like he hits the ball so hard without it look like he's trying to smash the cover off it. And I learned a lot just from watching him, realizing that Rob and well, I still consider him one uh, of the world's best. He makes it look so simple and so easy, and I needed to implement it into my game. How did I, how did I change the way that I bowl, simplify it to make it easier, but still have all those qualities, the power, the accuracy, um, I, I, the revolution. I needed all of those to stay there, but I need to refine my game. And, and that's where Deandra came into it a lot as well. She helped me do that. Fortunately, Roger was an inspiration for that. Watching someone like that, I had over a tennis ball. Uh, did you know, wings under him, it, it was pretty spectacular. So I look up to Roger, and, and you know, if I ever had that, uh, people that the most famous people over for dinner, Roger definitely has to sit at my table for sure. That's a great answer. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Very, very good answer there. Well, Jason, we appreciate all your time. Yes, thank uh, you very been, much. It's been very insightful. I'm sure all the viewers are going to love it, and hopefully we can have you on again in the future. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, Gaji, uh, you have my Skype um, ID now. So if you see me pop up on the screen, just click call or say good day. Awesome. Thank you very much right. again, and good luck in the Player of the Year race. You got it, boys.